And you've been doing a lot of OCaml recently, and I've just started doing OCaml. I've solved Advent of Code day one through three, and I'm just starting to play around with spawning a child process, reading uh, its standard out, doing uh, doing the LSP tools. I'm going to do that little LSP debugging thing. I'm just going to do it all in OCaml. I decided I just oh, want to be nice. able to take files and pipe it in and, and just have a nice view into what's happening as opposed to trying to read those actual files, which are all really long and kind of annoying to read. And so, okay. uh, because, you know, I'm using structured logging with Rust, and so it just makes it really simple. And so I have yeah. some initial thoughts of OCaml, but you've been doing it a bit longer, so I'd like to hear some of your thoughts about it and what are some of the struggles you had in learning OCaml, or commonly referred to in this community as ToeCaml. Interesting. ToeCaml, that's a new one. I'm not familiar with the distribution. Yeah. Um. So my... So the first thing is... I think obviously, I think this is kind of obvious for everyone who tries it at first, who it's their first one of like an ML style, is that <laughs> it's just sitting on your lap for this part, um, is that like the syntax is very different. And so for some people, that's going to be pretty off-putting, right, for like the first time that they they use it. So I think that that's probably like the first thought off the rip. But I'd be interested to know what your thought of the syntax is after trying a little bit, uh, trying it a little bit, because like I like it now. So, so the syntax really hasn't caught me too much. It's more like, you know, they say like when, when you're learning a new language, I've never learned a new language, by the way, but they say when you're learning a new language that you still dream in the language you knew. Mm -hmm. And when you speak, you do this like translation in your head, you take in the language, you know, and then translate it into the thoughts and in the other language and then that's like kind of how you have to do this translation mechanism i'm still in the translation mechanism category where i see ocaml yeah. and i relate it to a language i understand and so it's like i'm constantly doing this relation game which is okay which is the part of any learning experience but at the same yep. time because i'm not quite fluent in it things feel foreign though i really do mostly get it like it feels easy to learn uh, obviously I'm still a little bit worried about doing like string concatenation versus adding two numbers versus adding a float versus adding whatever, right? I know that there's like yep. some ununiformity and in type, uh, in inference that is super cool, but that's kind of like my first take on, on the syntax, which is it's virtually yep. no different and you can still do procedural if you wanted to, right? Like there's still while loops, yep. which I think is great. Yes. So, so that's sort of like after the initial impressions with OCaml and like literally the first time maybe that you read an ML style syntax, I think uh, some of the good stuff about it is you start seeing like, oh, I don't have to write types for anything because it has real type inference and it's yes. really good. Real type um, inference, not type definition inference, which is different. Yeah, not just making up new types. So the difference is that there's always only one type for everything. Like everything yes. always only has one type, which is not the same thing as like TypeScript just says like, we can figure out all the types that this thing could be, kind of. Because uh, it, <laughs> like, whatever, whatever it means when like there's an any somewhere in the mix. Yep. Uh, but, but so... So I think like that part feels really good and and is really really nice. I think the and, and like the type system itself is is good. I think it feels sound and the way that you do it feels really sturdy. Like you write something and then you feel pretty good that it's going to work. Very similar to the feeling that you get when you write Rust, I think, right? Where you feel like, oh, it compiled and my types are correct. I mean, except when you have magic numbers, which I saw when you were doing last night, you were, had some magic numbers problems to solve for um, the advent of code. But yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, the, so the I, thing I, that I, I really- like that. Hold on, let me oh, jump on. in there on the, on the inference. Yeah. Let's, let's go back and forth on these. You will lead it, I will do okay. the, I'll do the thing. I really like the inference. So I've always been a very big hater of TypeScript inference, I've always said, hey, I think that you're really using this language wrong. And a big reason, I'll, I'll explain a bit more why I say type definition uh, inference versus type inference. So in TypeScript, right. when you return a grab bag of properties, key values, it actually creates a type in that moment and says your type is in this shape. And the problem with that is that you didn't really, there's no hard definition of it. If you add a different return statement, it just simply gets unioned together. It's this or this, and it keeps on happening in this kind of way where it doesn't really guide you to write code in a way that produces consistent results. Instead, it just allows right. you to do anything. And when you want to change something, it doesn't break at your return point. It breaks at the usage point. And that to me seems like a really bad kind of uh, a trade off. And so that's why I always, always, always just do return typing because I feel like 
I don't like definitions being created. I want to be the one that creates the definitions and then says when types are being used. And I feel like OCaml kind of does that so far as as far as I can tell is that it, it you have to kind of you have to obey type system in a certain way and you have to define when types are being used when you need some sort of complex type or it can infer the more simpler stuff. Yeah, it can actually infer almost like in in practice practically like everything um in terms of like day-to-day -day style coding things obviously there are cases where you're going to need to write stuff down and the reason that it can do that is because it can everything can always only have one type so you can't return string and number right or array of numbers or array of strings you have yeah. to return some type that could hold both of those as a variant right where you would have like a variant that says list of nums or list of strings mm -hmm. and then you have to handle those on the downstream consumer you can't just like only do one of them right yeah tuples are fine to return but the tuples will all have the same type yep which yeah. could have like a type they're called type holes right so it could be like i know that it's going to be um a tuple with like length two right but they could both be sort of like generics is how you think about it in a different language right like yeah you can have if you had a function that take... over types right Yes, parent par parametric polymorphism. That's what it's called. Yeah, yeah. that's the one. Super cool. Yeah, look I at love you. You're already concept. yeah. You're already literally turning into like a functional nerd. You're like, wow, I got to use these big long words to explain this. Nice. <laughs> I, you know, I it's actually a super cool concept. I don't quite get it. And then the module level polymorphism that was going on with a uh, uh, maps, obviously yeah. a big hurdle the first time you see it because it feels super yes. confusing. But yes, I think. I think I'm like, I'm drawing pictures now, which I think are drawing boxes, which I think is the step one to any learning process. All right. Yep. What's the next thing? Enough with this inference and, business. Yeah. So uh, the next part that I've felt so far that feels good as a result of the inference is that when you want to refactor something, it feels very easy because if you basically have inference, like all the way through these things, then if you have a bunch of intermediate levels of stuff, Right, then you don't have to change those just because you change the type uh, at the top. Does is this that... is this because of a, a what's called parametric polymorphism? Yes, it is. Right, so it's like if you had if if in Rust, right, I change the like type of something, right, and I want to change the return type of something from like A to B. Now I have to go to all the places that like relied on this function returning A, even if I don't use A. Right, I'm just literally like passing it through yeah. everywhere i'm not actually not doing anything with a i'm just passing it through now you have to go fix all those which is extra worse if now b also has a lifetime yeah yeah yes yes <laughs> okay so i'm totally on that team where when you when you make changes in rust when you do refactoring the same same goes with typescript to a similar extent which is when you make changes you have this really 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 like long kind of refactor chain that's going on yeah, it's gonna be a little bit tricky. People are saying your mic's a little, a little goofy. A I little... turned it down just a touch. I don't know. It could also just be Discord sucks. Discord sucks for sure, but you sound a little bit clear. But yes, Discord is okay. Totally cool. ruining this. Um, I really like that. I really like that take because you know with TypeScript you do a lot of these programmatic types, right? You you define a type and then you define like this programmatic mapping, doing key of, type of, and grabbing things. Yep. And and when you change that, all of a sudden it's like this this huge kind of wave through your program just like rust with a lifetime that's exceptionally yep. difficult whereas i love this idea of of, of per, uh, parametric polymorphism is that what you call it Perimet yeah per that's, yeah i yeah. love that idea because then your types <laughs> they type they, they go from like it's not even top down right there's like there's definition points based on like operators used and stuff like that and then those points yep. are like the key points that kind of everything else can just flow through as various versions i love that yeah so so that's sort of like a result of inference and like alongside that the other thing that i enjoy is that it's still garbage collected but it's pretty fast for garbage collected language right mm -hmm. so then i don't have to think about lifetimes which tends to make it like simpler to get stuff done i, I mean i think that that is in general like objectively true probably that if you don't have to think about it for most cases then it's just simpler to yep. make it happen like i want to pass around a callback that's actually easy to yeah. do yeah callback <laughs> is a great like, example great example I, I can never figure out whether i'm supposed to use fn fn once fn mute oh it's actually not fn you're passing a closure oh these async closures don't have to say and you're like oh no yeah, i moment, just i can't oh you need to mutate something and it's like boom fn mute and then it's just like 
it, that the mute also because it's like a type, it spreads the exact same way. Yes, which is very interesting. Yeah. Like I love the idea of specifying mutations, but it also is leaky. It just like yeah. it just grows outwards. So, and we've talked a little bit about where I see like some of the future of OKMOL okay, potentially going with the work that's been done, like being done by Jane Street and others, right? With this idea that maybe there will be parts of the language where you can opt in to effectively no garbage collection, right? Because you're going to be able to just stack, put these on like a data stack and they'll get allocated and deallocated like without having to do garbage collection, right? So that's, so that's like a big win in terms of where I see the future of OCaml going, which makes me happy. Like I like where it's looking, yeah. um, which is a good feeling to have, even if that doesn't land, say for five years, right? You're like, oh, maybe it's not gonna land for five years. Well, that's okay. Like I, at least like the direction is something I like. That yeah. makes me happy yeah. comparatively to thinking, oh, we're just gonna have C++ 37 and like a pl <laughs> proliferation of new features that I can't keep up with. Yes. Right? So that, that's maybe somewhat different, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I always believe C++, best way to describe it, is that features continue until morale improves. Right? Like yeah, that was only... a good tweet. Did that tweet do well? I felt no, like it should have done better. It did not. It did horrible, which is surprising yeah. because it's amazing. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. hey, I like this old camel talk. I'm very excited. Here's, like, here's to month two. I'm only like 10 hours into actual programming of OCaml, but I love it. Yes. I love nice. It. I'm right. making you a site in OCaml, so soon you'll be able to have something real to do with uh, OCaml, which will be fun. Yes, no, I like that. There's still a lot of mystery when it comes to OCaml, but I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm excited. Yeah. All right. Uh, hey, TJ, where can people find you at? They can find me right now on twitch.tv slash teach underscore dv. 